This video will wrap up our series on the lymphatic system by looking at our lymphatic organs. Our lymphatic organs can be classified as primary or secondary lymphatic organs dependent on whether or not that is a location in which lymphocytes become immunocompetent. In a primary lymphatic organ, such as red bone marrow and the thymus, this is a location where lymphocytes are going to become immunocompetent. That is, they are then able to recognize and respond to antigens. However, in all of our other lymphatic organs, they are considered to be secondary lymphatic organs. These immunocompetent cells will migrate to these secondary lymphatic organs after maturation in the primary lymphatic organs. So now let's take a look at our first primary lymphatic organ, our red bone marrow. Our red bone marrow is found in the medullary cavity of our long bones and remember the distribution of this red bone marrow is going to differ between children and adults. In children, red bone marrow is located in almost all bones while that child is growing. However, as an adult, when you are done growing, the red bone marrow is limited to your axial skeleton, so your skull, sternum, ribs, and vertebrae, your pelvic girdle, and your pectoral girdle, and then the heads of proximal limb bones. A red bone marrow is going to be the site of hematopoiesis, which is the differentiation of our erythrocytes and many of our leukocytes, but not all of our leukocytes. So we have our neutrophils, we have our megakaryocytes, which are doing platelets, we have eosinophils, basophils, monocytes being produced there. And when we talk about immune cells becoming immunocompetent, we are referring to our B and NK cells. So our B cells and our NK cells are going to stay in our red bone marrow to become immunocompetent. And in fact, we call them B cells because they are bone marrow derived. Our second primary lymphatic organ is our thymus. Our thymus is located above our heart in our mediastinum and it appears to change size as we age. So our thymus when we are born is pretty large and it covers over the top of our heart. And our thymus does not grow with our body as our body grows. So our thymus stays the same size and we get a lot larger so our thymus appears to shrink. Our thymus is going to house developing T cells and they're called T cells because they are thymus dependent cells meaning that the thymus is in charge of these cells becoming immunocompetent and it is going to secrete hormones to regulate T cell maturation and activity. Now something really important about the thymus is that it has a blood thymus barrier and this prevents our new little T cells from coming into contact with our blood and becoming programmed to self antigen. So this blood thymus barrier is going to prevent our T cells from being programmed to your body cells and having autoimmune responses. Now all of the organs that we're going to look at from here on are going to be secondary lymphatic organs and they include our lymph nodes, our tonsils, and our spleen. So we're going to begin with a look at the anatomy of a lymph node. So our lymph node is considered to be its own organ because we have this fibrous capsule surrounding the outside of our lymph node. Lymph nodes are generally kidney bean in shape and this indention here is called a hilum. The hilum is where blood vessels, uh, nerve fibers, and our efferent lymph vessel are going to communicate with our lymph node. 
our fibrous exterior is going to send extensions into the middle of our lymph node that create trabeculae that partially divide the interior of our lymph node. We can also divide our lymph node up by the outside of the lymph node and the inside of the lymph node. The outside is always called the cortex and our cortex is going to be filled with lymph nodules and germinal centers where our B cells are going to divide and differentiate into plasma cells. So here we have another representation of our lymph node and again we can divide our lymph node into the cortex and the medulla, which is this inner portion here. The medulla is going to be filled with lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages, reticular cells, and reticular fibers. And here in this picture we can see lymphocytes attached to reticular fibers. So we have a looser network of cells in our medulla than we have in our cortex. Another thing that we can see in this picture is we have many afferent vessels, many afferent, but only one efferent vessel. This means that more lymph is going to enter our lymph node than can actually leave our lymph node. And this is going to cause stagnation of lymph to ensure that all of our pathogens have been found, identified, and destroyed. So once a pathogen is found in our lymph, it gets carried to these germinal centers where we're going to start producing lots and lots of B cells and also T cells to target that specific pathogen. And as we start to divide and make new cells, this lymph node is going to swell and that simply is because of the increase in volume of material inside our lymph node. We call this lymph adenitis where the lymph node becomes swollen due to the proliferation of lymphocytes within that lymph node. Next up we have our tonsils. Our tonsils are going to be located in our pharynx and our pharynx is divided into a couple of different uh, substructures. So our pharyngeal tonsil is located in our nasopharynx and we only have one of those. We have two palatine tonsils located at the end of our soft palate, one on each side. And then we have many little lingual tonsils and uh, the number is actually up to individual variation and they take slightly different forms. So we've got three sets of tonsils and they function to guard against inhaled and ingested pathogens. So they're sort of a first defense on um, pathogens that may enter through your nasal or your oral cavities. Lastly, we have our spleen. And our spleen is very important because it is going to filter our blood. So just as a lymph node filters our lymph and looks for all of the possible pathogens that might be present in that lymph, our spleen is going to filter our blood to find any abnormal cells or pathogens that may have gotten into our circulatory system. So our spleen is a very soft walled organ. It doesn't have a shape of its own. It just kind of conforms to the shape of the organs around it. But we do have a hilum where blood vessels enter or leave and also nerve fibers enter or leave our spleen. So if we take a look inside of our spleen, we actually have two sets of tissues in our spleen. Our red pulp is going to consist of our sinuses that are gorged with concentrated erythrocytes. So at these sinuses, our red blood cells are forced through itty bitty tiny capillaries and then our erythrocytes leave the bloodstream and uh, enter the tissue of the spleen. 
Our white pulp is going to consist of lymphocytes and macrophages that are aggregated along uh, the small branches of our splenic artery on reticular fibers. And these leukocytes and macrophages are going to recycle old, dead, or damaged red blood cells. They also monitor the blood for foreign antigens and initiate any immune response required with the presence of antigens. So here in this picture, it is just a different depiction of our red pulp and our white pulp. So you can see our red pulp is made red by our erythrocytes, and then our white pulp is called white because it doesn't have that red color, and we have all of our leukocytes in this area. Finally, we can see this on a slide of the spleen where our leukocytes stain purple. We can see them. And then our erythrocytes in our red pulp areas are just going to look pink or red. If you have any questions about the lymphatic organs, please do not hesitate to contact your instructor.